Welcome to the Cheely Law Review. My name is Ben Burnett. My guest today is Bob Cheely. Bob, welcome to the show. Always good to be with Ben. I want to talk to you about some of the high-profile cases that you've been a part of. And further in the series, we're going to talk about some of the cases that didn't necessarily make huge headlines, but your firm added tremendous value to that individual's life. That is not this episode. I'd like to talk with you about the Mosley case that puts you on the map as a plaintiff's lawyer. Yeah, that's a, that's a very tragic case. It's a, every parent's worst nightmare. They get the knock on the door, police officer standing there, and they break the news to you that your son has died in a, in a tragic automobile collision. In this case, it was Tom and Elaine Mosley, who lived in Snellville, Georgia. Their son, Shannon, 17 years old, they, when he turned 16, they bought him a used GMC pickup truck, full size, thinking that they were putting him in a safe vehicle, when in fact, they were putting him in a very dangerous vehicle. Everybody's probably, that's at least 40, 45 years old, maybe they've heard of the Pinto, the Ford Pinto. Pinto had a terrible reputation for catching on fire. For catching on fire when you get rear-ended. Well, the GM pickup truck uh, had an even worse reputation than the Pinto. A lot more people were burned alive and or maimed for life in a GM pickup truck than in Ford Pintos. There were 10 million GM pickup trucks built with these fuel tanks located in a very vulnerable location with no protection. It's like God designing us with our heart outside our rib cage. There was absolutely zero protection of that fuel tank from side impacts. Cars run traffic lights all the time and have intersectional collisions. And uh, these pickup trucks were rolling vehicles, you know, that, that uh, considerable amount of gasoline in these fuel tanks that were protected only by a very thin layer of sheet metal uh, from the bed of the pickup. So I get this uh, a friend of mine who's a lawyer in Gwinnett County gives me a call. He was friends with Tom Mosley and my friend Gerald Davidson called me and said that Tom and Elaine Mosley were, had just lost a son. And I said, yeah, I heard about that on the news the other night. This was in October, I think, of 1989. And uh, their son was on the way home from a high school football game. He had just taken his girlfriend home and dropped her off and was headed back to, to his home. Went through a traffic light on a green light, and a drunk driver ran into him and T-boned him, and Shannon's truck fuel tank ruptured and caught fire, and there were several witnesses, including a Gwinnett County police officer who saw the whole thing happen. And uh, the officer saw Shannon Mosley uh, when the vehicle came to a stop trying to get out of the cab of the truck, but he was engulfed in flames. And Shannon's autopsy showed that Shannon didn't have a single broken bone in his body, no ruptured organs from the impact. He, was, uh, he died from burns uh, and inhalation. He had in his throat and in his lungs, he had soot and carbon monoxide in his uh, bloodstream. So we, we know that he lived, and he would have walked away but for the placement of this fuel tank in a very vulnerable location. So the defense had a very big team to represent General Motors in this lawsuit. Yeah, they had the largest law firm in Georgia, King and & Spalding, and King & Spalding was in the case up until just a couple months before trial, and then they brought in another big firm from Chicago, Kirkland and Ellis, to try the case. At any point, did something like that deter you or make you nervous? No, not, you know, I, I knew that we had a solid case. In any case, you have to prove three things. You have to prove that in a product liability case, you have to prove that, that the uh, product was defectively designed. I knew that, that this product was des defectively designed, and the fuel tank, even according to GM's own documents, it, they described the fuel tank as being in a, quote, vulnerable location, quote, close quote compared to their other later model trucks that came out after this truck's life history uh, had run its course. And Ford and Dodge also had their fuel tanks in a very safe location from 1973 through 1987. They had their tanks between the frame rails underneath the bed of the truck. GM had their tanks outside the frame rail, just inside the sheet metal of the bed of the truck. So my uh, former partner and I, you know, worked the case up, and one of the great witnesses that I've ever seen of all time is a guy who did work for General Motors, and I found him. His name was Ron Elwell. He had retired as a fuel systems engineer. 
uh, from GM. It's a really interesting story. I called up Mr. Elwell. Remember, this was before the internet, so you couldn't look up somebody very easily and find anything about them. I called him at his at a phone number that I've got on him in in Detroit area. Told him I was a young lawyer here in Georgia, just an old small town country lawyer, and I was handling a case for a par- grieving parents who lost a 17 year old son. Told him the story about how they made that decision to buy that truck, thinking that they were putting their son in a safe vehicle. And uh, he said, "Well, you know," I, I, and I asked him if he would help me get to the truth uh, about what did GM know about the truck. And what documents are there to, to prove GM's knowledge or crash test? And uh, Mr. Elwell politely declined to get involved. He said that GM had promised to send him some business as a consulting engineer after he retired, so he would still be earning some income. And I told him, I said, well, I really wish you would reconsider because I think you could help a lot of people. You could help save a lot of lives if people just knew the, the truth about how dangerous these trucks are. So I'm one, as, as anybody that knows me well will tell you, I don't take no for an answer. Yeah, um, I, can, I can jump in for a second. I've never had Bob Cheely try to do something that he wanted to do and him just simply go away. <laughs> go on. Yeah, I'm pretty stubborn. I'm kind of like a cross between a mule and a bulldog. So I, uh, I, I learned that, that Mr. Elwell was going to be in Atlanta giving a deposition in a different type of case against a big truck manufacturer where he was serving as an expert witness for the defendant. So I, uh, I was starting to think, okay, how can I get in front of this guy? I can show up at that law firm and hang out in the hallway, you know, where the deposition is going to be given. But then I said, nah, that'll be creepy. You know, he'll think I'm stalking him or something. And, but I need to get him in a cap, captive situation. So I, I had the idea that if I could get a seat on the airplane flying back from Atlanta to Detroit next to him, he can't go anywhere. And uh, he's got to sit and listen to me for a couple hours. And I just I felt like if I could get in front of him, it would change his mind. So to make a long story short, I was able to secure the seat on the, on the Delta flight in first class sitting beside him through the help of a friend of mine at Delta. I'm sure they can't do that today. They probably can't do that anymore. <laughs> but yeah, I told the, the, the person booking the seat for me, I said, this is an old friend of mine. He's going to be so surprised to see me. Thank you for helping me to get the seat next to, to Mr. Elwell. What does that conversation look like, and what changed his mind? And talk about the, the timeline there of in the, in the case you made to give him the opportunity to do the right thing. By that point in time, I'd, I had uh, gotten some dis, you know, discovery responses, interrogatory responses back from GM, and we knew there were hundreds and hundreds of these uh, cases where people had either been burned or alive or, or killed from these fuel tanks. So that was one thing. Just to, you know, just doing the right thing uh, was going to be my, you know, was my pitch to Mr. Elwell. And then secondly, uh, it didn't hurt at all that he liked to drink scotch. And so uh, I made sure that the flight attendant kept him uh, well libated. By the time we arrived, he had agreed to help. What did Mr. Elwell have to offer that case that no one else you talk about silver bullets and you talk about not wanting to go in the front door where they expect you to walk in through talk about the decision to ultimately leverage him utilize his expertise and and really how you treat because it's it is about him but it's also about expert witnesses talk talk about how you use your creativity in in your thought process in your firm today and and the difference that that makes in a case like this, where it is a $100 million case when back in the early 90s, $100 million is a lot of money in 2023, 2024. It was an astronomical amount of money in 1993. Talk about the decision process and, and, the, and the expert witnesses that you use and how some things remain the same. I looked uh, Ron Elwell in the eye. I was wearing jeans, cowboy boots. I, I let him know that I was from a small town that Even my own family owned one of these trucks uh, back when I was a teenager, and I can't believe that I was driving one of these trucks. And didn't know. And didn't know. And so I just appealed to Mr. Elwell's sense of public safety, you know, that that the public has a right to expect that the vehicles that they buy to transport their family in is not going to kill them in in a survivable crash. And as it turns out, Mr. Elwell told me that GM 
had hidden from him. Uh, he went to testify in court one time in de- the defense of this vehicle design. And after he got through testifying in that case in California, he learned that uh, GM had conducted a bunch of secret crash tests on these trucks. Practically every one of them failed the test. Like 24, 25 different crash tests at, up in at Milford Proving Ground and in, in outside of Detroit. So he felt like he had been misled too, and he had just gotten through telling the jury that he was not aware of anything on behalf of the company that uh, would prove that these trucks were dangerous. And when in fact the company withheld that information from him, he felt scorned. He felt, yeah, he felt misled, and he felt like they had sent him into court to commit perjury on behalf of the company. When you get to the conclusion of that case, what was the most gratifying part of it for you? I remember as soon as the jury reached its verdict and and the judge allowed the jury to leave the courtroom, I just remember seeing my client, uh, Elaine Mosley, just release probably four years since her son, she had lost her son. She and her husband just, uh, they just had this release of all this emotion and they, they just began to sob. Their whole motive, taking this case to trial and not taking money from GM and selling it, they wanted the public to know how dangerous this truck is. And this case was aired live on Court TV for four and a half weeks in early 1993. And so the whole country did get to see and hear the testimony. And so uh, they felt like it was their responsibility as, as human beings to make sure that no other family made the mistake that they made and buy a truck with these fuel tanks and put a loved one in that truck. How long did it take GM to make the appropriate changes after that? They had already started manufacturing in 1988 model year. You know, four years before we went to trial, they'd already started making a, a new truck, totally redesigned with the fuel tanks where they should have been in the first place, under the bed between the rails. The rails are about four, 34 to 40 inches apart. And it's where the drive shaft is right. under the truck. So they had already been doing that. And, and one of the really amazing things is I found, uh, not through GM, but through other sources, sales literature that, that were, would have been in a GM dealership. And where they were, truck first came out, the new design in 1988, they went through in this piece of literature and they showed the changes between the, the new 88 model and the pr- previous models dating back to 73 where the fuel tanks were in you know, a terrible location. And in fact, they picture there where they said that the new truck's fuel tank is in a much less vulnerable location. That's horrible. And so, you know, that's, that's just using the defendant's own words is always the best. Is there anything about this that you want the public to know with the way that you conduct business? I dig and I dig and I dig to get the facts and get to the truth. I believe the words in the article in The American Lawyer were, a relentless appetite for the truth. That's right. quote from the Bible is, you'll know the truth and the truth will set you free. Well, in in a courtroom setting, too, it, it's very important to get the truth in front of the jury, the finder of fact, and so that they can make the right decision. Finding Ron Elwell was huge. Uh, Ron Elwell began, went on to be an expert witness in, for me in other type of cases and for other loggers around the country against other automakers. And I do know this, that because of Ron Elwell and his involvement in this Mosley versus General Motors case, which is a bellwether case that people know about across the country, particularly loggers, automotive safety has been improved significantly because automakers know that they will be held accountable, particularly if I get the case, they'll be held accountable in a court of law and they can either build a safe vehicle uh, on the front end or suffer the consequences in the front of a jury. This has been another episode of the Chile Law Review. Have a great day, everybody.